Can you share? Okay, hi. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, so nice to see people in person and hello to everyone joining us virtually as well. Uh, my name is Katie Milkars. I am a licensed clinical social worker and I'm here from Life Stance Health. Um, would like to share with you a little bit about Life Stance Health and specifically our program that we have for licensure candidates. Um, so for folks who are seeking to move forward with their clinical licensure, whether that be in counseling, social work, psychology, or marriage and family therapy, that's a little bit about what I'm going to share today. Got it. Okay. So Life Stance Health, I'll be speaking more specifically to Colorado and our program here, but Life Stance Health is a national organization. Um, we quickly, we are in 31 states um, and have over 4,000 clinicians who provide services um, and approximately 500 centers. So here in Colorado, we cover Fort Collins, Greeley, Loveland, the greater Denver area, and we go as far south as Colorado Springs. Life Stance Health provides a variety of services. So we provide psychiatry services, um, TMS, um, child and adolescent therapy, couples therapy, families therapy, um, just a myriad of different services. What I'll speak to today more specifically will be our psychotherapy services and the pathways to licensure um, that those offer. So we do offer in-person and telehealth um, services as well. So our candidate program here in Colorado um, is comprised of about 70 candidates right now and about 30 clinical supervisors. So the program is specifically designed to um, support those who are working towards their clinical licensure. It's a very unique path. It's a path of growth and learning. Um, and we really believe in the importance of the supervisory relationship and training, quality training um, for folks who are looking to build their skills and really grow and and learn as therapists and counselors. So the different licensure pathways I've listed here, I do want to do a small disclosure. Um, I will share right now what I know of the most recent requirements for DORA, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, the Division of Health um, Occupations are all governed, all the different boards are governed by those bodies. Um, and sometimes the requirements for licensure will change. So I always recommend no matter where you are in your journey, if you're going to be moving forward with some sort of licensure in that way, please verify that information with DORA and with the relevant board. So. The first candidacy status is the licensed social worker, and that is for individuals who are working towards their licensed clinical social worker credential. Um, so essentially what happens is in the candidacy column, um, we hire candidates here at Life Stance Colorado, and they are paired with a supervisor in the full licensure column, who is the type of person that can provide them with ongoing supervision and training, help them to learn and help them to gain those experience and supervision hours that are required for them to apply for their clinical license with DORA. So first is the licensed social worker, moving towards the licensed clinical social worker. The licensed clinical social worker currently um, requires 3,360 experience hours total. 1,680 of those need to be clinical. Um, so that's direct therapeutic contact. And then the rest of them can be administrative case management type services. Um, there's also just another disclosure, different caveats between the licenses that I'm going to share. So I'm just sharing the, the general overview of those. Um, so that supervisor is able to support that candidate throughout their journey um, to uh, work towards those experience hours and the required supervision hours, which is 96 hours for licensed social workers. Generally, there is a period of two years, a minimum that's required before you are able to apply for the full licensure. Next, we have the marriage and a family therapist candidate, the MFTC. Those folks are supervised by LMFTs, licensed marriage and family therapists, and those require um, 
2,000 hours total um, with at least 15,000, 15,000, oh goodness, please, not 15,000, um, 1,500 of those being direct clinical and 1,000 of those being relational hours. So that's going to be couples or family um, type services. Um, there is 100 hours of supervision required for um, the LMFT licensure and 50 of those currently um, need to be face-to-face. Then we have the licensed professional counselor candidate, the LPCC. The requirements currently for the LPC license are 2,000 hours. Um, there is flexibility right now in terms of if that comp uh, is comprised by administrative or um, direct clinical time. And there are 100 hours of supervision required to obtain the LPC. Next, we have the provisional psychologist um, supervised by the licensed psychologist. Um, this definitely has several caveats. So again, always encourage folks to look into their board. Um, it's 15,000 hours of experience are required um, and 75 hours of supervision. Some of the caveats include um, research and teaching hours. There tend to be um, maximums that are allowed in those areas. So at Life Stance Colorado, our candidate program, um, we really, really believe in the importance of that supervisory relationship. Um, I think in any setting, whether it's clinical um, or any job that you've had, if you have a quality supervisor who is supportive and knowledgeable and understanding, it can really, really, really make the difference in your journey. So we do our very best to pair um, folks based on their candidacy status, but also their clinical interests um, and the areas where they really like to grow, um, as well as what kind of supervisor they would like. Um, feedback style that's helpful. Um, we really want to create a setting where we can nurture candidates on their journey um, and make sure that they feel supported and grow confident in their clinical skills. In supporting learning, growth, and connection, these are some of the um, pieces of the program that I wanted to share with you specific to the candidate's experience. We really like to put a lot of different supports in place and a lot of different opportunities for folks to learn and grow. So the first is going to be individual supervision. Um, and again, another disclosure, um, things are always subject to change, um, but generally weekly supervision is provided. Um, what is nice Nice about Life Stance Colorado's candidate program is that that supervision is um, provided at no cost to the candidate, um, and it is a part of their uh, weekly tasks and duties. Um, in addition to that, we provide group supervision, which is a great opportunity to connect with peers across the state of Colorado. Um, being in the COVID era, um, most things are virtual right now, so it is a great opportunity to connect with folks in the Springs or Denver, you know, folks that are in different areas of the state. Um, and then next we have clinical trainings. These are provided on a monthly basis and we recruit our clinical supervisors um, who have very unique skill sets and talents um, to provide these trainings in a variety of areas that interest our candidates. So that may be in um, cognitive behavioral therapy. It may be in crisis support. It may be in play therapy or family therapy, um, different types of um, areas that people might be interested in and learning a little bit more about. And then in addition to that, we have leadership support. Um, so I myself am the director of the candidate program. Um, we have an assistant director and we make ourselves available on a weekly basis. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult, of course, when a program is so large, but we really like to try and touch base with everyone and get FaceTime with everyone as much as we can. And then finally, there's peer connection and consultation. I think in this COVID era, right, things can feel pretty isolating. And so we have a new program, which we call the POD program. Um, and this is a group of about five um, or six candidates that we pair together um, locally or from across the state. And this is an opportunity for um, all of the candidates to treat each other as peers, know each other as peers, and find how they would like to support people. 
Um, so that's really, you know, the pairing is done. And then we would like for the candidates to have conversations, share resources, share experiences, share challenges, share wins. Um, just so, you know, there's that element of connection, which I think has been difficult to, to find all the time. Should I just... <clears throat> Okay. Sorry, everyone. Okay. So that is a brief overview of our candidate program. I have included um, my contact information up here. I'd like to open it up for questions um, that anyone might have, and then any questions that may arise at a later time, you're more than welcome to reach out to me via email here. Great. Yeah, go ahead. The services are provided statewide, yes. Um, as long as you are licensed within the state that you're providing the service, then you're good to go. Once you start to go between states, it gets complicated. Do you have a question? Yeah. No? No, that's all right. to apply for candidacy? Candidacy or to the, the program? Okay, so candidacy to the state. Um, if you go to the Department of Regulatory Agencies, depending on which type of clinical licensure you are interested in, they will give you a checklist um, that's comprehensive for all of the different things that you will need in order to apply for the license. Um, that's going to include your experience hours, which need to be signed off by a supervisor. That's going to include exam results as well. There are different exams, national exams for all of the different licensure pathways, as well as an application, an application fee, et cetera. Um, but basically those, those are the big pieces. Um, in terms of the candidate program for Colorado, um, when we are hiring candidates, it's, you know, if you see the ad on Indeed, um, you reach out to me if you're interested in learning more about open positions, and you move through an interview process, um, as you would for any other job. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Okay. I think we'll um, keep a little piece later for additional Q&A. Um, so again, if any questions come up at a later time, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. And thank you all. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, Katie. You, you might not trust me on this quite yet. Okay. Let me make sure. Yeah. Where, where is the button? Uh, that... Okay, thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I got it. Mary? Yeah, thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Mary McMahon. I'm with the Office of Behavioral Health, um, part of the Colorado Department of Human Services. And I'm the manager of the Certified Addiction Counselor Addiction Training Program at um, the office. So. My role there is to set up the addiction trainings and approve trainers and to determine what coursework is um, necessary or needed for the different addiction counselor levels that we have. <clears throat> so just want to start with, you know, that people heal in relationship, as, as Katie was saying too, like so many times um, a big piece of all of our lives are the relationships that we have, right? So. So we go into maybe this line of work or we go into this field um, seeking out to assist or to help people build relationships or, or keep healthy relationships, right? So as behavioral health providers, we help people heal, right? So that should be an overall goal that we're all seeking as we're, as we're going into this field. So just want to review, um, Katie talked about a little bit of this, but we just want to talk about some of those um, behavioral health education specifics. Um, so in high, so for high school, you can be a behavioral health technician, 
a certified addiction technician or do some entry level positions. So for example, doing working in a detox, uh, medical detox, working um, at a mental health center um, where you're doing admission summaries or you're doing intakes or case management, working with families, doing education. You can do all of those things as a, with the high school diploma with as a behavioral health technician or a certified addiction technician. We also have associate's degrees, which is again, still the behavioral health technician and the certified addiction technician. Um, our bachelor's degree are for social work and that's our certified addiction specialist. And those of you that were attending the panel a few, a little bit ago, heard a little bit about the different levels for addiction counselors. So at the specialist level, um, we do require that uh, behavioral health bachelor's degree. Our master's degree just um, as well as the licensed social workers, licensed clinical social workers, licensed professional counselors, licensed marriage and family therapists. And we also have a licensed addiction counselor um, as well as um, with psychology. And then obviously a doctoral degree um, doing the teaching and the clinical psychologists. Um, so just some of the scope of practice, um, all of these are behavioral health entities. Your licensed addiction counselor requires a clinical behavioral health master's degree. So it does um, allow that individual to do both um, substance abuse as well as mental health. So that's kind of the combination in that. Um, but I think we, these were talked about um, on that. Your specialist, your clin, your, cl yeah. Uh-huh. Um, is there a difference between the high school versus the associate's level? Because it looks like it's the same position. It's the same. It would be the same position. It's just it's just identifying that there's an associate's degree, but it would be the same level because until you get to the bachelor's level is when you can practice independently. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, that wasn't clear. Um, so for your scope of practice, your um, if you're licensed, you can practice independently. Um, at a certification level, it would be your addiction specialist that can practice independently. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need some water. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so, yeah, so at the technician level, high school graduate, you have a thousand hours. So before you have to register in DORA's database, you can gain up to 1,000 hours of um, direct clinical supervision. Um, but once you hit the 1,000 hour mark, you need to get registered in DORA's database for any of your additional hours to count. <coughs> Excuse me, getting over a cold. Um, so, and then you, there's an exam that you have to pass, a national exam, and then pass the jurisprudence exam, which is part of um, DORA's licensing process. So DORA's, um, entity that will actually give you the certification or the licensure and OBH's training program is what sets the trainings and the education standards. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Here's some of the required trainings for, at the technician level. We have training centers around the state that offer these courses online and in person. <coughs> so it's, um, these are all available to you. Um, so addiction counseling skills, case conceptualization principles of addiction, you can read through those. So these are some of those, um, there's nine classes that are required at the technician level. And then moving into the specialist, once you get your bachelor's degree, again, psychology, social work, human services, you need 3000 hours of clinical supervision for addiction work experience. Um, these are direct clinical hours. So, um, they just, as of yesterday, was the 1st of March, we just had OBH rule go into effect where some of these um, things were updated and changed. It was 2,000 hours, now it's 3,000 hours at specialist level. Um, and that you have direct hours instead of indirect and direct, right? Everything's combined into one, so we're trying to make align that so it's not quite as confusing. Um, there is a national exam that you uh, would need to take and pass and then pass the jurisprudence exam. And again, that's part of DORA's licensing or certification process. We have these required trainings at the CAS level. Keep in mind um, with your college um, degree, some of these course, courses do have college equivalency, so you wouldn't need to take all of them. There's seven classes that don't have college equivalency, and I believe I have them on the next slide that you'll see. 
So the licensed addiction counselor, that's your master's um, in clinical behavioral health. Um, again, those seven classes that are through the training program, you have 2,000 hours of clinical supervision, which um, for your clinically supervised work experience hours for your LAC, you don't need to wait until you have your master's degree. You can be earning your hours during your master's program. So you can be taking <coughs> the coursework, getting your hours, um, and once you have your master's degree, you would sit for the MAC exam. You can't do that until you actually have your master's degree in hand. But once you have that, then you take that. And so you could be licensed within just a few months of getting your master's degree. So, um, and then again, your LAC allows you to do, you know, substance evals and practice independently and assessments and um, allows you to do co-occurring um, behavioral health as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. You can just go directly to your LHC. You don't need to start with the C the technician or the specialist because you would want to apply for the level that you're at, right? Right. So you get your master's or you're working on your master's, you take these seven courses, you get your hours, and then like I said, you take that MAC exam as soon as you have the master's and and you can get your you can have your LAC within months. Yeah. And and previously to March 1st, yesterday, <laughs> it was indicating that for the LAC you had to meet all the requirements for the specialist. However, um, our house bill passed, so um, OVH was able to determine what courses were needed for the LAC. So there's no longer that requirement that you have to demonstrate or show that you meet all the CAS courses and all the CAT courses. You just have seven courses. For the LAC, no CCE review, that's part of DOOR's process where you would have to demonstrate educational equivalency. That's no longer needed as of yesterday. So that's exciting. That's very exciting. Um, so I left, I have the handbook link and I, I think you have access to the PowerPoint, but this is where our handbook is that is fresh off the presses from yesterday. Um, <coughs> as I indicated, uh, for the LAC, it's it's a much, hopefully going to be a much smoother process to get, to get that credential. Um, and just a reminder, DOOR is the one that issues it, and OVH is the one that sets those trainings. So you will find on this website, too, you'll find on the handbook, you'll find a link to the training centers, to the proof trainers. Um, those training centers will have their, like when they're offering their courses, like I said, they can be online, they can be in person, they're around the state. Um, and there's my contact information if you have any questions about your process or um, how to become an addiction certification or a licensure in the state. So do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah, we have a question from the online group. <coughs> uh, do either of you have any opportunities for undergraduate students who are looking for internships? So what I would recommend whoever asked that question, um, I, I don't, um, OBH has a listing of providers that um, substance use treatment agencies and providers around the state as part of our ladders program. So if that individual has a chance to, um, and you can certainly put my email in the text box or the chat box, I can send them the link to that and then that'll give them um, an opportunity to search providers around the state. Unfortunately, we do not um, at Life Stance at this time, um, but at a later time, definitely encourage anyone who might be interested um, in, in pursuing or more information once you get to that master's level about what could be next for you. Mm -hmm. So in order to get your LLC, you need 2,000 hours of experience working specifically with um, individuals that have issues with addiction? Yeah, so you would be supervised by an LAC by a licensed addiction counselor. And like, yes, it's clinically supervised work, addiction work experience hours. And um, the LAC also has a candidate status. So um, once you graduate with your master's, you can apply for candidate status. And that enables you to go out and work in the field and provide services. <coughs> and you have four years to obtain your LAC after that. So very similar to the LPC, LMFT. <coughs> All right. Does that help? Yeah, okay. some people going through their LPC would basically be like, you're doubling the hours essentially because you need the, the 2,000 as an LPC and then you would also need the, the 2,000 supervised. Okay. 
So ideally, it would be someone who has an LPC with an LAC. You can get concurrent hours at the same time. You don't need to do like the, these 2,000 hours and then these 2,000 hours, right? You can do it concurrently at the same time. Okay. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, I guess this is for, for both of you. Um, if you have a uh, previous um, supervised experience, does that cannot be used towards the hours or does it have to start all over the hours? Um, so your, uh, your clinically supervised work experience hours are good for five years. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your addiction coursework, um, outside of taking courses at a university or um, institution of higher learning, the addiction counseling hours without equivalency, I'm sorry, trainings without equivalency are good for five years as well. And that'll also be important just to check uh, the credential <laughs> of that person who provided the supervision. Um, for example, um, with the LCSW, the LMFT, and the LPC, um, LPCC candidates can be supervised by licensed clinical social workers, um, but licensed clinical social workers require the supervision of a licensed clinical social worker. And for uh, licensed marriage and family therapists, they also require um, the same type of supervisor. And the same goes for psychologists. It has to be someone who is a licensed psychologist to sign off on those supervision hours. Okay, thank you. I have a question. As far as uh, supervision toward licensure, um, if if someone is aspiring to the next level in their career, and if they don't have someone who can supervise them uh, at their current place of employment, I, I wonder if you could speak uh, about how they how someone could go about getting their supervision hours and, and what that entails, what that looks like, and, and if uh, there's costs associated and such. Just, I, I think that could be helpful to maybe some people who are interested in this. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. And, okay. Um, you are able to find external supervisors. That is the path I believe a, a lot of people take if it's not available at their place of employment. Um, so you can look, um, if you are in Facebook groups, you can look on Google, um, you can seek that external supervisor. You'll want to make sure that they have the license type um, that you're looking for. There is a way that you can verify um, individuals' licenses on the DORA website. It's a public lookup, so I would definitely recommend doing that. And the cost um, is generally per hour, and the rate will depend on the clinical supervisor. Um, generally, I, I would say more recently, I've seen um, $100 an hour and up. Totally agree with that. Thank you, Katie. Um, and again, our ladders um, system identifies substance abuse treatment license centers around the state um, that you can certainly reach out and contact and see what, what kind of clinical supervision they're providing, if they have openings, um, that sort of thing. So, would it be like so yes, there's been recent um, funding that's become available for individuals um, to help with their higher ed degrees, with their graduate degrees. I think they mentioned that in the panel this morning. Um, to help with higher degrees and to help with these addiction trainings, those seven I identified, um, or seven that I indicated. So there is funding out there. We have different agencies. Um, they're still working on those contracts to get those in place but they're either in place or will be in place within the next week. So certainly reach out to me if you have um, questions and I can forward you on to um, who's overseeing the, the funding for that. So, but we are very excited about that. We also have um, a program in Colorado already established that offers scholarships and grants for the addiction program. And we work with HRSA, which is federally funded. Um, they also um, provide um, dollars for um, higher degrees and, and training. So. some other questions you might have. Mm -hmm.
whenever you're able to. Like as soon as you um, are able to be, to get supervised, to have a super, so as, as an undergrad, so you'd be looking at getting your specialist, right? So you can be supervised by another specialist or by an L LAC. And so as soon as you're able to start getting hours, you can, you can do that. And for the master's um, <laughs> clinical licensure levels um, that I had initially mentioned, um, those hours tend to be post degree. Um, so once you have your master's degree, you are able to start accruing those hours. Um, and Dora can, can always um, confirm um, what that actually looks like for your chosen licensure pathway. Okay, are there any questions in the chat or anything? Okay, great. So we answered all those wonderfully. That's awesome, right? Good, good for us. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, certainly reach out to myself or Katie if you have additional questions. Happy to have to help answer those. Like I indicated yesterday, just made some changes with the, the process. So if you find that you're kind of not sure about something, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have on that process for certification or licensure for addiction. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. There is a survey, if, if you take just a minute to fill it out, you can scan the QR code uh, on your flyer. If you have one, if you don't, I think I could find that QR code for you, but uh, there's a chance to win a, a prize basket. I did, I did, I did scan the QR code. Yeah. And it's kind of something you don't have to do at the end of the day, right? Could ask you about each individual group. Well, you can, but I mean, you'd be lying about it. Could have it. You'd ask me about all of them. They were all great. They were great. Why would it be asked? You know what? I don't know how I set that up. Yeah, but it's. Yeah, no, I'm good. No, I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just put it on hold. Yeah, I just put it on repeat. I did whatever the last session. Okay. Just things for the whole day. So I had to meet them. So Mary and Katie kind of have the end of your day. So you go ahead and fill that out. All right. I hate to initiate a conversation that they're asking questions. But it wasn't really necessarily a question. It was just a statement and an observation. Um, I'm, I'm a peer specialist for North Carolina Health Alliance. Um, and uh, there is a lot of entry level um, positions um, that don't require anything but your high school diploma and equivalency. Um, those positions um, for students that may be listening, if they're still online or what, they, um, they've been a pathway for me to, to have my supervision paid for, to have my education paid for, um, because I, I, I signed on with an organization that was willing invest the money in me. So when I signed on as somebody who signed up for this experience only, you know, I was an oil field truck driver before I worked in any type of behavioral health field. And um, so it, uh, struggling with addiction myself and then taking my career path into uh, recovery services. Um, I just think maybe in, in the beginning, you could have touched a little bit on peer, peer work and those types of certifications because they are necessary for a state credential. So, so we, so for the peers, um, I guess I was looking at more like our process for what Dora regulates. They regulate the certification or the licensure, and not and Dora doesn't regulate peers, right? Peers are are a state credential um, that you receive whatever training you went through, right? Like if you went, you know, to Rocky Mountain Health Crisis Partners, or you went to Mental Health Partners in Boulder, or wherever North Range, wherever you received that peer training. So that and that's who who gives you that certification, and then the state has like a certified peer and family support specialist. So I guess really this was this was kind of looking more at to be regu when you're regulated and you are getting certified or licensed in the state, then it's it's a different sort of process than what. Than what you're kind of to. seems to be the natural progression, right? It's like you go from a certified peer to uh, your your certified addiction technician, and it's just kind of like just the way it's, it's the path, you know, the things that you encounter on the road um, when you start working in this field. 
Sure. And a peer could be someone with, you know, that as at the master's level that has lived experiences that did get go through the peer, right, and get a certified and then is seeking their LPC or LAC. Absolutely, you can be on those same paths, right? Like, so you still have where you're, you're regulated, but you're still doing, you know, your peer work. So those those positions are are that are offered too. Mm -hmm. to, to add to that, since you have a captive audience, um, would you, given all the knowledge that you have with the state and everything, is there um, a suggestion of how somebody could work themselves through to an LPC or one of those credentials? Um, working in the field while also kind of finding those access money, right? If we're trying to open it up for um, diverse populations who may not have that income to support. So, and I think that's what our funding right now is coming through with and across the state. Mm -hmm. um, so we have our managed service organizations that are gonna be given that grant money that are then gonna disperse that out to different entities, right? Around the state. So absolutely, you're working at a, a center or a mental health center and you're getting your hours and you're going to school and you you know absolutely you can continue on that career path that will take you you know whatever level you decide to go to right wherever you want it to be at but there's certainly um, a very exciting times right now that we have this additional money that's coming to our state um, that we'll be able to share with individuals to to go get to the credential or certification that they want to be at is this like just an initial push kind of like the first my understanding with the managed service organizations, this is going to be sustained for at least five or plus years. What would be your biggest piece of advice or like the biggest thing that's underutilized? That's underutilized? Maybe a resource or something. Um, I think maybe just the how many um, LACs we do have in the state that can provide that clinical supervision. Um, I think clinical supervision is a, a huge piece of all of this. Um, and so just finding even maybe not those, the, um, you know, like a community mental health center, but maybe you're finding a, a, a treatment center that's a little bit smaller than that, right? And seeking out some of that type of addiction service work or mental health services. Mm 